To get started, let's have a brief look at this five-layer model of a database system. Many of the named concepts here should sound familiar to you, particularly at the top level we have relations and views, and we know how to uh, make use of them. We would use SQL, the query language, to express queries against the database system. The database system internally would not look at SQL, it would transform the SQL queries into internal representations. And if we further go down here from SQL level, talking about relation and views, we will see that internally we're talking about records and accesses to records. For instance, here, find next record or store record. We're talking about the record-oriented in interface uh, as opposed to the set-oriented interface. When we further go down, we see we're talking about pages, segments, files, and blocks. Um, buffer management is one topic we also consider in this um, lecture. And at the very bottom, we have the operating system and interfaces to devices. We're talking about cylinder and tracks of a hard disk. The undergraduate course primarily looks at this level here on writing SQL queries and on, on creating relations and views and on entity relationship modeling, also relational algebra and so on. In the current course, we want to understand a little bit better the internal you know, routines of a database systems in order to understand where performance improvements can be achieved and which aspects lead to a bad performance. When we talk about performance, we have to also understand what kind of cost we have to expect on certain operations. And this chart here, or this slide here, is, uh, was created by Jeff Dean of Google. And he put together some like numbers which would give you a feeling for the individual costs. These numbers are um, some years old already. It's also important that they are very accurate. Important is that they give you an understanding about the relative differences between accessing data, let's say, in the cache or on hard disk. You see, the first entry here gives you half a nanosecond for a L1, so level one cache reference on accessing data which is in the L1 cache. Comparing this to the L2 cache, we see um, it's seven nanoseconds, so it's almost a factor of 10 between. This is still like considered reasonably cheap. If you compare this to main memory references, that costs 100 nanoseconds. Yeah, this is quite a big difference. For us, primarily in the database system world that we consider, in a centralized database system, we are interested in understanding the um, implications of having data on disk versus having data in memory. Because when we look at the disk, we see that the disk seek, so the time it takes to position the disk according to a certain position where you want to read from, a certain block you want to read, this costs 10 million nanoseconds. Now if you're comparing 10 million to 100 nanoseconds, you see that there's a big difference. This is called also the access gap, and this is also one reason why we have buffer management in database systems. If you're looking at these 10 million nanoseconds, which essentially is 10 milliseconds for one certain access to the disk. You compare this to reading one megabyte from a disk sequentially, this costs 30 milliseconds. So you see also um, it's a factor of three slower. Here we're reading quite a lot of data as opposed to here accessing only one block. We will then see where this comes from and particularly also how to benefit from this observation. Another illustration of this access gap or the costs we have associated with different locations we're accessing data from is given on this slide. At the top level, you have the access to a CPU register, which is super fast, it's less than a nanosecond. Then we have the L123 caches here they're given like they're more than a nanosecond, so they're slower than the register access. And then again, we have memory and so on. Now, interestingly, on the right hand side, you see the analogy between the accesses to the CPU and caches and so on 
compared to you accessing information, let's say, from your head. So if you um, have um, access to a CPU register, this is considered to be here in this analogy um, to be in your head information, and this takes one minute. Now if you're going now one level down, and the information is not right away in your head, but in the same room you're in, it takes, let's say, 10, min 10 minutes to look it up. Let's say you're going to the bookshelf, you're taking a book, and you're reading it. If you compare now the access, having information stored in a room, and this should be the analog one to the cache, and now we go to main memory, we see that the main memory of 100 nanoseconds corresponds to having information stored in a city somewhere. You have to go by bus or car and pick it up. And now we have the access gap of 10 to the 5 between memory and external storage. And this corresponds to the difference between finding information in your city compared to finding information on planet Pluto, which takes two years to go and retrieve it. And even worse, going to disk, uh, sorry, going to archive or tape or DVD information takes uh, more than a second. And the analogy is that this would be in Andromeda. So it's 2000 years cost to retrieve, right? It's not so important that these numbers are accurate. Certainly these are not really accurate at all. But what is important here again is that we're talking about an access gap of 10 to the 5 between memory and external storage, this storage. And this is the reason well, we have to address this. And the, the idea here is to use buffer management and also to avoid certain access patterns that would cause many of these hard disk accesses. So this is an illustration probably all of you have seen in one or the other lecture. It's a depiction of a traditional hard disk, the way the hard disk works. So you have different platters. This illustration, there are five. And there is this arm that can rotate. Here you can see it a little bit better. So the arm can um, rotate by this arm pivot. And on the top of this arm, you have the head. And the head is able to read data from the disk. Now, if you want to read a certain information from the disk, and we talk about sectors here, which corresponds to blocks. So you want to read from here. You have to rotate the arm a little bit so it's that the arm is positioned exactly here. And also, we have to wait a little bit so that the sector will move below the head. Additionally, if we want to read from a certain sector of a specific platter, let's say this one, we have to activate, we have to switch the reading head to be now the active one reading from this platter. And this altogether costs time. And this is exactly the disk seek time that we have seen earlier. And the number you can remember is around 10 milliseconds for such a disk seek. So to summarize, we have tracks and sectors. Sectors are part of a track. And these sectors are what we also call blocks. And blocks are sometimes also said called physical records. They're the smallest transfer unit. That means whenever we're accessing the disk, we read at least the block size of, for instance, 4 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte, historically like 512 bytes. So this is like the smallest transfer unit for these block storage devices, like hard disk as you have seen. There's a little um, note here that if you're looking at the, at the, at the tracks or the cylinders, these, um, um, it's clear that the outside ones could store more sectors. In fact, it was usually assumed that the number of sectors per track is the same for all tracks. But uh, in modern hardware, this is done differently. There are zones which more or less sectors, but for us it's important that we understand that we have block storage devices and the, the access granularity is at least one block. And uh, we will work with this in the forthcoming slides. If you're interested in such hardware details, you can go and execute 
uh, for instance here under Linux, the HDParm tool. And this gives us uh, all kind of information. For instance, we see here in the, in the hard drive in my office PC, there are like this number of sectors and the sector size is 512 bytes. So in total, uh, you can see that it's a one terabyte hard disk. You can get some more information uh, here if you're interested in that, but for us again, it's only important to consider these um, different access patterns. So you can read a certain block or multiple blocks in the sequential way or one by one in a, what we call random access fashion. So a database is eventually stored on disk. So eventually a database can be seen as a set of files. And a file is a sequence of blocks. There's also this concept of segments, which is the organizational unit inside the database systems, for instance, regarding rights, access rights, and so on. What we can access, we're talking about the internal um, structure or the internal routines the database system has, we can access segments, pages, which are stored in the segments, and pages that are containing records. And a record is nothing else than a sequence of bytes stored in the page. And the record corresponds to the tuples of our relational database. For instance, if you have a table with um, students' information, like matriculation number and so on, this for one entry of this table is called a tuple. And this tuple is then, when it's stored inside a page, called a record. Little outlook. There's also different ways how you can map segments to files. So segments contain pages and the files contain blocks. And um, here you see an illustration, a very simple direct page mapping. But uh, we will not go into detail here because we don't really distinguish between uh, segments and pages and files and blocks. Because later on, when we talk about index structure performance, we were mainly concerned with keeping the number of accesses whatever you call that, to pages or blocks, low. So we don't really need to distinguish here because we also don't do anything about write management. We don't distinguish between segments and files and blocks and pages, right? So what you see here is an illustration of two pages or two blocks. Every page is organized into multiple slots. So you see this page here, page with ID 273, has three slots. Likewise, the page 827. The header information here is pointing to the data records. So these are the tuples inside the page. We also see that not only tuples are stored, but we can also ref uh, reference another page. For instance, if one record was getting too big and had to be moved from one page to the other, we store here the page ID and the slot number. So this is basically a link to this page and the first entry here, basically to this tuple. Yeah. These identifiers consisting of a page ID and a slot number are called tuple identifiers or row identifiers. Row identifiers, because if you're looking at the table, Every row corresponds to one tuple. So row and tuple or record are the same concept here. So if you're looking at now one specific page or one block, you see here there are three tuples stored, talking about lectures with lecture ID and then the title of the lecture and so on. This is page 4711. And this tuple identifier is pointing to the tuple corresponding to the logic course. 